Okay, we are live. We are? Okay. Excellent. That's what it says. <laughs> All right. Well, hello, hello to everybody out there. I am Richard Whitaker. I'm the screens editor with the Austin Chronicle in Austin, Texas. Uh, and it is my genuine pleasure to... Uh, have you all here for this uh, special uh, watch party for uh, one hour out call which i saw earlier this year and kind of fell in love with and uh really feel very lucky to have been invited to be part of this uh, mm -hmm. event today and just want to introduce uh, first of all uh writer and star william norrit who plays greg hi richard thanks for doing this oh my pleasure uh star natalia rachoa who plays esmeralda or anna depending uh, at what moment we're looking at it. Uh, star Kristen Carey, who plays Stacy, And director T. Arthur Cotton. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so just to run over the, uh, every other, the format for what we're doing, we're going to uh, you know, talk for a little bit about the film and about the making of it. And then at uh, 20 past, we're going to start watching together. And you, you get what is basically a... Uh, one of pretty unique uh, director and cast commentary, which is, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to a lot myself. So, I mean, like, let's let's start at the obvious place, which is uh, the writer. So, uh, William, like, tell us a little bit about the background to, you know, coming up with it with one hour out call. Um, okay. Um, well, I mean, a few years ago, uh, you know, well, I mean, making a film has always been a long dream of mine. Um, and I knew that uh, I was probably going to have to, you know, kind of make a micro budget. And um, the idea for the film came to me while I was living in this loft apartment in downtown Los Angeles. And I didn't really get my act together uh, trying to be able to shoot there, but I talked to the you know, during. Uh, this gestation period, um, and I bounced the idea off of him, and uh, he was very excited about the idea, and basically gave me uh, the go-ahead to let him know whenever he was ready or I was ready, and uh, then I took a trip around the world and kind of wrote the script during during my travel, and when I came back, I just decided that now was the time to try and get it done. So that's when you know T and I started to move forward. So what was the genesis for the idea of it? Where did the idea of you know, this relationship between, you know, Greg and Esmeralda and this, these complicated layers of, of who they are and what they're trying to get out of each other, like the evolution of that? Um, well, it's it was part by just, I mean, when you're making a micro-budget film or you're trying to get a micro-budget film off the ground, you're trying to kind of minimize cost. So I, you know, I thought... Uh, I thought a movie that was essentially a two-hander would be a good place to start, but I am, I am interested in power dynamics between men and women, and I am, you know, as, as I've, you know, I'm on the, I'm on the cusp of middle age. Um, as you approach or enter middle age, you kind of, you kind of are interested by the dynamics between older men, um, younger women, um, those power dynamics. Um, I'm not a father, but uh, I know several of my friends and peers are fathers, and you know when their their daughters are entering college age or a young adulthood and so forth. So those kind of those kind of dynamics, romantic, sexual power, those all kind of uh, intrigued me, and I thought it would fit well in kind of a two hander with basically a man and a woman kind of having this confrontation on film. So I tell you, like you know, you're the the other partner in this this complicated dance, in, in kind of two roles, the you know, the two different sides of this of this one woman. Uh, you know, when you read the script, you know, because you know, Esmeralda goes through so much, and such a complicated character who isn't there. You, know, you don't know exactly who she is at moment one, in the same way that you don't really know who Greg is. You know, when you read it, when did you, you know, what was the, for you, the un, kind of the unfurling of Esmeralda and, and, and Anna? Set it up. Going. Okay. You're muted, Natalia. <laughs> Shouldn't it be better? Um, the question was, the question was, do you mean like the first time I read it or just um, like once I was in the project? No, the first time you read it. Like, you know, mm -hmm. who did you think she was when you first read, started reading the script? And then as it goes along, you find out a lot more about it. But who did you mm -hmm. think she was? So because, because the, 
that was written so intensely and in the dialogue is um you know she she comes off as a very intellectual woman so i knew that some underlying she would uh you know be in this line of work so i thought that she was a strong person that clearly had a lot of secrets and i was in, interested and intrigued with the way that it was written as to find out what those secrets were because um you know we never know why people do the things that they do um and afterwards i definitely find out and with talking with will as well with bill <laughs> not will william bill <laughs> Um, you, I, uh, you know, I also discovered where all her motivations came from as well, but I always thought that she was extremely intriguing and just smart and, uh, like very, like just, um, with, with like a clear vision of what she wanted. I mean, it's, the whole thing is this relationship between the two of them and this, this complicated dance of. They're both getting something, and what exactly is it? And the kind of the reveal of that is is pivotal to to the film. You know, when you were putting the script together, part of the structure, part of it is this structure, this dance across time, as much as it is dancing their relationship. And I was wondering about that, about coming up with this, because there's a lot of ways that it, this could have worked as a stage play. The structure of it is what definitely makes it a film. And I was wondering, uh, William, about about that the way you structured it, because it is so pivotal to, you know, what makes this so cinematic? Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, again, it's kind of twofold. The first, uh, the first fold is, again, you're, you know, you're going to make a micro budget movie and you know, you don't have any money. So what can you do to kind of set your story apart from just a typical film that's got a big budget? And the nonlinear aspect is something that definitely makes the storytelling unique. Um, but the second fold is, strictly related to the story and what that is is i wanted to i wanted to have a non-linear episodic kind of script and story but have that non-linear story still have a normal course of arc over the course of the film um so i i, I challenged myself to kind of break it up with these episodes but also as the episodes were jumping back and forth um to still continue on this steady arc uh of the relationship between the two characters and working with t and then writing the script, which actually entailed me basically writing all of the episodes in their entirety and then kind of pastiching them together, um, which works surprisingly well. And then working with, with T to kind of strengthen that arc. And then once the film was in the can, working with Sam, the editor, to make that storytelling even more effective during the course of the nonlinear thing. I mean, I did challenge myself, but I also did think it was interesting to try to tell a story that had a steady arc while it was bouncing back and forth. And I think we've done that pretty well. Oh, definitely. That's one of the things that I really admired about this when I, when I first watched it. Uh, uh, but, you know, like you said, you, you know, you are a guy on the, the cusp of middle age. So am I, I'm not saying which side of the cusp, I'll just, we'll both leave that one to, uh, <laughs> to the audiences. But that at the same time means that, you know, this is, you know, you're coming from, uh, from a man's perspective, but it's, you know, there's a lot of balance in here. So it's only about, you know, trying to find, you know, Natalia's voice in there and, you know, and trying to find the, the voice for Esmeralda, but also trying to, trying to find the voice for, you know, the other uh, female characters. So, you know, I mean, how much did working with the, the cast kind of help shape those voices? Because if you're talking about power, power relationships and power dynamics, you've got to understand both sides of the equation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know that T can speak to this. And uh, the first thing is both the actresses we have right here, Natalia and Kristen can speak to this because at a certain point, even if I've written the script at a certain point, it's not mine anymore. It's for those actors to kind of own and kind of shape their characters themselves. But what I will say to it is when I was writing the script, I knew I'm telling a story about a man and a woman. I know I'm telling a story about an older man and a younger woman. And I know I'm telling a story about a, an escort and her client. So there's a danger there in not serving the female characters well enough. I think that that's been done plenty of times. And I really, 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 it was important to me that all the characters be three-dimensional, uh, especially uh, the women characters. And I'm obviously not a woman, so it's not my normal, natural perspective. So I really strive to make everybody three-dimensional. But at a certain point, T took over and Natalia and Kristen took over, for example, and Shannon 
took over and they really fleshed out the characters and made them three dimensional. But that was, that was important to me. And I think we've done that well too. So, so I think that, you know, that comes to then to uh, Kristen and, and Natalia. I was talking about, you know, the, for you as actresses coming in and being able to, you know, affect what was there and you know what did you feel you really brought to the discussion of power dynamics particularly when it comes to you know, you know in, in the case of Esmeralda and Greg you know an older man and a younger woman and in the case of Stacey and Greg you know people of, uh, a man and a woman of similar ages I'm sorry did you ask me that or did you ask oh me no that was to uh, Natalia and to uh, to, okay. to Kristen thank you yeah, so I think especially between Esmeralda and uh, and Greg, there's already, especially in the beginning, right, when they are first developing their uh, dynamic and relationship as a client and um, um, and a person that wants a service, it's it's the the dynamic is already there because she puts those boundaries and she puts those restrictions of being like, well, you know, I have a booker and you know I'm here just for the hour, and she she makes those things very clear in the beginning. And then we see how later on that kind of just starts to bleed out a little bit because uh, she, I think, was letting her wall down, her emotional wall with, which was a, um, you know, something that that I decided for the character was the first time that it was happening to her. So that's where it gets, you know, so confusing and just kind of like, that's where you, you start gripping to the story because, you know, you're like, you know, you see, you see her start with a certain dynamic and then as the relationship evolves, there's like this internal battle with Esmeralda that's happening between understanding that she still is a client and understanding her role and her position. And she's here to do a job and a service, but then how does that get mixed in with the actual feelings that have arisen throughout the time that they've known each other? Um, and with the power dynamic at first, because it's, you know, it's very clear, I think that she has control and she has the power, um, especially because that's what she comes with. And then as time passes, it's almost like the, the roles get reversed, right? Because she's losing control by the end and she doesn't know what to do and, uh, and, and how to handle the situation. Um you know, the, it's rare that you see, you know, rare that you see fil uh, films where, you know, sex workers are treated as rounded characters. Mm -hmm. You know, they're often props or, you know, they have a linear narrative. And it's very rare that you see a, char a, a sex worker who is, you know, is allowed to be seen as liking their job. And, mm -hmm. you know, that this is a, a, you know, we've actually had two films this year uh, that have done that. It was... Uh, uh, both one our outcomes a French film called Alice, the both of which dealt with exactly that issue of you know a sex worker who wasn't yeah you know, I was thinking about that you know, of developing a depiction of, of a sex worker that isn't two dimensional, but also the de the depiction of you know a, a at the end of the day a a customer um, and it's it's kind of you know again that's never how it's depicted it's always you know there's there's often this kind of sleazy edge to it that was you know that's really one of the fascinating things about this film like you you get that you know uh, for me there was kind of that david Bermet edge to it like you know this you look at a an unconventional business um and find the humans within it i was wondering about that but, you know because this just is a topic you don't see handled like this and people you know in these relationships handled in this kind of way yeah so both both you and william Mm-hmm. Um, oh, so here's my kitty. She's joining us. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think especially with the way that it's uh, that it's written, it, I, I think it came off as something that this is something that she genuinely enjoys because, you know, I definitely made the decision with the information that I was given in the script that this was a, a, a decision that Esmeralda made because she actually enjoys sex. And because she actually enjoys this aspect and because, you know, she it's it's the she, I made the decision that because she came from a life that just wasn't necessarily in service to, of, to her, that this was her alternate persona. Right. This is where she really got to kind of like be herself and play this character that 
um, that she didn't really feel in her in, as her student life, right? She just was very determined to get from point A to point B. But with this type of work, she got to just really express her femininity. And she got to express her dynamic of feeling powerful in the moment and in control because her life has always not been in control, right? Um, and especially because she doesn't have a parents and you know she just grew up with her grandmother and her backstory so i really thought and i and I actually i did a lot of research on sex workers and there are many that really love what they do and it makes them feel extremely empowered because of the fact that they are mm -hmm. stepping into like their full feminine grace and because they uh, they like enjoy the aspect of of uh create like having the service to a man and i thought that that was really important for me to bring because that was a, a perspective, like you said, that hasn't been seen. So, but but it does exist, and this is the reality of of sex workers that many of them really genuinely enjoy what they do. I remember there was a moment um, when Bill was writing the script, and we were going back and forth, and you know he was sending me different drafts of the script, and and we would we would talk about this and I remember early on sort of challenging Bill in a good way to, to really explore why does Esmeralda do this work? I think it's important for the audience to understand where she's coming from. And to Bill's credit, he, um, he added the moment where we really see it in their first meeting um, and I don't want to spoil anything and I don't want to say anything too graphic, but, uh, but it, it makes it clear in a very subtle way that, oh, she actually enjoys doing this. And I thought that that was sort of the decision that Bill had made is no, I, I want her part of her motivation for doing this to be not only financial, but that it's something that she actually enjoys. So, so that was kind of an element that I, uh, that Bill added that that I thought was important. Yeah. I mean, you can have the typical kind of uh, escort kind of John kind of story and you know, that the escort is downtrodden or she's forced to do this or compelled to do this. And I think that that's been done a lot. Um, and it's not very interesting anymore. What interested me is telling a story where the sex work aspect was important because that's what she does, but it was just, it was fine. There was nothing, it wasn't something that was called attention to all the time. And it wasn't something that was commented on all the time. And it wasn't something where there was any moralizing going on. It was just, just a fact of life. And then let's go on from there and let's talk about the story. Um, I'm glad that you brought up David Mamet. He's, he's a, he's a, a hero of mine. And I was thinking about this actually a couple of days ago. And one of the models, I didn't really have any direct model um, for alcohol. But what I will say is I was thinking about his play and then later his movie Oleana, um, just in terms of it's a man and a woman. It's a two hander. <clears throat> it deals with power dynamics. It's, you know, it's a vastly different story, but, uh, but that relationship kind of older, younger, and then kind of combating each other as the story goes on is something that I kind of, I think, uh, uh I think the spirit of it, uh, got into one hour alcohol. I will actually be starting the film in a couple of minutes, but uh, you know, uh, T, I, I wanted to ask you, like, yeah, um, kind of one of the golden rules for filmmaking uh, for a director is keep the writer off set as much as you humanly can. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have a problem for you there. I was talking about that, about, you know, we're talking about power dynamics. You know, I've got a bunch of friends who are, who are writers and they're like, yeah, they, they bring me in for like an afternoon and go, look, it's your film and go away. But I was thinking about <laughs> when you're working with, you know, uh, you know, one of your lead actors is also the script writer and therefore has this different insight into it. But at the same time, you know, as director, you kind of, you know, you're shaping the vision of the film. I was wondering about balancing, the, you know, the, how you two worked out where the power dynamic was between you two. Uh, as right, you know, as both writer and director, and director and actor. Uh, it's a great question, and there, so it's kind of a complex thing, right? Which you've alluded to, um, and I think that Bill and I navigated that fairly well. I mean, 
it for me it was a challenge in a positive way uh, to be working within a script because a lot of my films are improvisational and I did want to work with the written word um, because I think that's a different different kind of challenge for a director um, and I was really looking forward to that and Bill uh, you know, we were, we were going through this process for years before we ever started shooting. So we had kind of developed a rapport, uh, that carry over onto set. And I'm not going to say it wasn't stressful, but there were, it, it was the same kind of stress that you have for any kind of shoot. It wasn't, it wasn't the stress of like, Oh God, I can't do what I want to do because the writer is here. It wasn't that kind of stress. It was the normal stresses of, you know, uh, is everybody going to show up today? <laughs> you know, it's a micro budget. Uh, are we going to have enough time to shoot this uh, at the location that we've paid in advance for? Um, you know, uh, am, are the are the are the actors going to feel safe in this environment to be able to express themselves and? to be able to explore the lines that are written. Um, and it was tempting at times for me to fall back onto, well, let's just improv it because I, I know that that works because I've done that before. But, you know, it's just a matter of like, okay, what, what is working for Natalia? What is working for Bill? What is working for Kristen? What, is, what do they need to get them to a place where they are connected to the lines and connected to their characters and connected to the performances. Um, and so I think, you know, and, and Bill can speak more to this, that I, th I don't think the stresses were related to the power dynamic between Bill and I, because Bill basically had decided at a certain point that he, you know, that I'm going to direct it um, and he's going to act in it. And he trusted that I was going to respect his script and I was going to respect that uh, his vision for what he wanted for the film. And he was also going to respect my vision and my visual style and that I'm going to um, make the film the way it should be made. And, and Bill tells kind of a, a funny story. I don't know if you want to tell a Bill about, uh, you know, uh, you getting more takes, or you getting less takes than Natalia, and right, right. Um, I think I think that kind of firms up. Like, okay, Bill trusts me to direct this film; that I'm going to do a good job. Well, <laughs> here, here's what I will say: like when I wrote the script, there was a brief moment where I entertained the notion of directing it myself, and I was already kind of on the way of kind of discarding that idea. When a friend of mine was like, "You'll lose your mind if you do that. That's way too much for you to to bite off." <laughs> Um, and I agreed with them, but more importantly, I wanted to, it was an artistic challenge to myself to trust somebody else with my work. I, I've directed a bunch of my own stage stuff. Um, but this was a big thing for me to kind of, to write something and then hand it over, uh, not to mention the fact that I was going to be acting in it. So I needed to trust somebody and I've known T for a long time and I do trust him creatively. And I think that with very few exceptions, I, I, you know, I was able to just kind of go, no, it's, he's directing this. So it's like, I don't think it really came up at all. I think perhaps maybe there were individual lines or different parts of the script where I kind of resisted a little bit and kind of, kind of maybe marked my territory as the writer, but no, I, 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 I really wanted to trust somebody else with this. And so I think once we got on set, like T says, my concerns and my stresses were, are we going to make our day? Um, are we going to have enough money to shoot next week? Are we, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't stress about the power dynamic between a director and a writer. Um, it was just the power, it was the stress of just making a micro budget film. So. Well, you didn't tell the story, Bill. Oh, uh, what's the story? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll tell the story. Yeah, tell the story. <laughs> So Bill and Natalia have very different acting styles and Bill, I think would, he generally would get, and he was very familiar with the script, not that Natalia wasn't, we had rehearsed quite a bit and, and, but Bill, you know, had been living the script for, for a long time. So, and, and, you know, different acting styles. So Bill, uh, 
he would get it usually on the first take was the was the take that we used the first or second take and then beyond that i would notice the more direction i gave him the more he would tighten up and get in his head and it just didn't come across as natural whereas natalia was the opposite she would give a great first take and then a better second take and then a better third take so it was like she wanted to it was like she she was getting warmed up so the more takes we did the better her performances got and so i just kept doing more takes and she would she would communicate that to me like okay i want to try something different here i want to try something different here and it was exciting and it was fun not that it wasn't exciting and fun to work with bill but at a certain point bill came up to me and said Hey man, do I just suck? Like, am, are you just giving up on me? Like, I, you're giving Natalia all these takes, and I, you only give me one or two. You know, at the most three. And I said, I said, Bill, do you think I'm trying to make a bad movie? <laughs> and I think that. What saying, Bill, what are you saying, Bill? Do you think I'm deliberately trying to make a bad movie? At which point, I kind of recognize my paranoia. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I think that was kind of the moment of trust. It's like, oh, okay, he's he's trying to make a good movie. He's, <laughs> you know. Well, I think it is time to actually start watching the film. Um, yay! Which I, 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 <laughs> uh, I hugely enjoyed the first time I saw it. it. Kind of, it was one of these films that, as I was watching, I was you know kind of put the pieces together, really get unfurl. Um, and uh, you know it's so performance driven in just all the best ways. And and like I said, I mean this could have been very stagey, but you bring something really cinematic to it, and and that's you know really uh, you know, where it really shines for me. So um, oh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. So I hand over to our our uh, tech guru Sam um, for to explain how, exactly how to watch along. And the brilliant editor. Sure. Um, oh. <laughs> So the, the film is now available for uh, anybody that has an Amazon Prime account. It's uh, free to watch on Amazon Prime. So that would, I think, be the easiest way for anyone to watch it. Uh, it's also available on iTunes um, and uh, several other places. You can go to our website, onehouroutcall.com, to find any other places to view the film. Um, but like I said, uh, Amazon's probably your best bet. So uh, head on over there and start watching the film. And uh, uh, should we'll we do a countdown or something like that? So I, I, feel, I feel it earns a countdown. I think I think it's a, 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 a it's a countdown um, kind of thing. Should we uh, sure. start from ten? Sounds good. All right. Yeah. Okay. Everyone, Everybody. get your movies ready. Yeah. Fire <laughs> <Well, why not? laughs> up your movies. <laughs> yep. If you're on Amazon, you should see the uh, it, when it comes up. You should see the Gravitas Ventures logo. For uh, our good friends at Gravitas. So, and starting in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and press play. It's playing what's happening. Okay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for hosting this, Richard, and the Austin oh. Chronicle. Thank you to the Austin Chronicle. Absolutely. Our pleasure. Playing what's happening. Okay. <laughs> I've got mine muted. I don't know if. Thanks for hosting this, Richard. All right. <laughs> So we, I don't know, I, I'm just going to jump in. So, uh, and then feel free to ask questions. Um, we shot in downtown LA at uh, this opening scene is uh, a location called Location 606. That's literally the name of the location. It's basically a two-story home in the middle of downtown LA. Uh, near Skid Row, which I guess when they bought the place, it wasn't near Skid Row. And then unfortunately, you know, the situation in LA as it is, Skid Row has kind of spread out. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're portraying uh, Skid Row as uh, San Francisco here. <laughs> so Skid Row LA is San Francisco. Um, and 
Sorry, is it distracting that I'm looking at my TV this way while we? <laughs> okay. no, I think we're all going to get we're all going to get used to it. I will. Okay. Take, I'll take mild issue with the near Skid Row description. Um, <laughs> Technically, not Skid Row, but but I would remove the adjective. That's just me. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So the and the challenges of that were you know obvious noise challenges and. You can hear a little bit of that bleed over uh, into the movie in certain scenes. Um, we had a, uh, a, a wonderful sound designer who um, did the best he could. <laughs> and uh, I, did, I think he did a fantastic job, actually. Yeah, of course. And actually, there are aspects where it kind of works with the film, frankly. So. Yeah, right. So I guess I'll, I'll speak to this opening sequence. Uh, this was something that I had envisioned um, really after reading the first version of the script and probably before that when Bill had described the movie to me. Um, I wanted to have something that sort of tied, tied together the idea very quickly that the movie's gonna be jumping back and forth in time but within the same hour. Um, so I had always envisioned something where, where, uh, where the, the camera is sort of the timeline is jumping, um, is sort of in a line. Um, and originally I thought, okay, well, in, in what happens in every episode and every episode she walks from the car to the, um, to the door. Um, so that's a place where I can jump in time. Um, but it doesn't happen at every, at the same time in every episode. So I thought, okay, what happens at the same time in every episode or pretty close to the same time and her actually, Esmeralda actually coming to the door happens at about the same time. So that's when I sort of conceived of this opening where I basically locked down the camera for three days and, and we shot that sequence, uh, which just ended according to the, the version that I'm watching here. That was my car driving on the road there. Every <laughs> time the exciting part about filming that opening, uh, or just about filming the entire film, was the fact that we actually filmed it chronologically, which like never happens. So, I just realized I had to uh, <laughs> I was gonna say somebody's... <laughs> Watching it, it's me. Right, it's possible, it's, so it's possible to watch with the but captions. We should do that. Not to mention the fact that I spent three very uh, labor-intensive, agonizing weeks creating those captions. So yeah, <laughs> that was one of the biggest structures of the entire production. I already know the lines. I'm going to watch it on mute. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> what were you saying, Natalia? Oh. So. Uh, Oh yeah, that I was saying that I loved being able to um, to film it chronologically because that hardly ever happens with films. So it was like me and Bill kind of like from the very beginning all the way to you know the fifth time that we uh, you know that we meet each other, and it it was cool because I got to completely be able to um, what do you call it to grow with the character at that point, like chron chronologically as opposed to just jumping back and forth. It was just nice to grow with Bill and just get more comfortable as like time went by. And with those those different sections, did you did you shoot each of the encounters and each of the hours chronologically uh, on set or did you be back and forth on those? For the most part, we shot in chronological order. That opening sequence, um, Obviously, you know, we shot that within three days. So, um, so that was a, that was the only, not the only part, but one of the only parts that wasn't shot completely in chronological chronological order. But even that, for the most part, we did. And then after that, everything that takes place in this location was shot in chronological order. Um, I would, I think that the only exception to that is the bathtub scene which we shot in a different location. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The infamous bathtub scene, which <laughs> T and I over the course of the production, we don't have a bathtub yet. We don't have a bathtub yet. 
when we just waited until the very last couple minute. Bathtub, the bathtub and the abuela. Those were the two things where we just kept kicking the can down the road and like we don't have to solve that yet. We don't have to and, the, and the car. Yeah. Oh right. And the car. Right. Yeah. Right. The, the car that uh, well, I don't want to spoil it yet if people haven't seen it. Right. Wait till we get to that section of the movie. But yeah, those were things that were in the back of my mind the whole production. I'm going Man, I know you think it's easy to get a bathtub, but uh, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> I like to have everything lined up, everything kind of locked in. Otherwise, I don't trust that it's going to happen. And, that is and that is a lesson I learned. It's like it's never too early to, to lock up. Yeah. I forgot to say, Peter Fintrip is the uh, sound designer and the colorist who did a wonderful job. Um, I don't know if it... Are we all muting our, our versions of uh, yeah. one hour alcohol yeah. as we play yeah, it? Is, yeah. Oh, okay. Great. Um, oh, the car scene. I was very proud of this uh, car scene because the car is not actually moving. Um, so Sam edited, or, or Sam added the movement in post production. And Sam and Bill held lights up in front of the car, uh, up on ladders, I think, right? Oh, yeah. To give yeah. it that kind of downward motion, yeah. So I'm slightly more proud of my light waving than I am of the actual script because you can watch the car and it actually looks like there are taillights and brake lights that are moving past the car. Sam and I did. That's where Sam and I really grew to be friends, actually. I didn't know Sam that well when the production started, but the two of us at two in the morning just waving lights at a non-moving car really brought us together. <laughs> and one of the things we're, we're introduced to in, that, in those, that opening sequence is the different looks of Esmeralda, which are kind of reflective of different aspects of her personality. That Greg is, is very much, it's Greg and this, you know, slightly different variances. Like there's one t-shirt, I think, in there, but the rest of the very, very, very set feeling for him. It's very, you know, this, there's a, there's a certain order to how he comes at the world. But, you know, Esmeralda invents these different aspects and these different, this, these different versions of herself that she's, delivering to uh to greg and i was talking about that about you know they are very different um and they you know each of them has a very different role reflecting the relationship and where it is at different points so i was talking about that about developing the looks as kind of reflections of the character go ahead t sorry uh that, that was my daughter walking back in in the background <laughs> she'll be walking back again in a moment um <laughs> so the different uh looks of the film um yeah, and, and particularly esmeralda's different different outfits because they you know each of them is kind of there's something she's doing something different in each of those hours there's, you know it's and that, that's kind of reflected from the outfit that she feels comfortable wearing and she's bringing different parts of herself to to Greg in each hour. And I was talking about developing those because they, they the the look and the the characters and what she's giving away at that point are so intertwined. Yeah. Um, so that a lot of that was tied to the script and what's happening in each script. That kind of informed what. Uh, it was what the looks were going to be. Also, Rebecca Michaels, the the costume uh, uh, woman, um, she was integral, obviously, in, in um, finding the different outfits. And what I had communicated to her was that I wanted each section to have its own distinct look. Um, not only just to keep uh, the audience sort of connected to this nonlinear story, but, but visually, I, I, I love that kind of stuff. Like, um, I didn't fully achieve this, I don't think, but, you know, an example for me is the cook, the thief, his wife, and her lover. I love that, that kind of switching between different moods and different looks um, visually and with different colors. Um, and I think 
uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, this is sort of informing what's going on with, with Natalia and what's going on with Bill. It, it was that part of the question that sort of emotionally what's happening with them? Yes. Okay. Um, that was not as conscious. I mean, you know, I, I think there's a certain element of just kind of going with your gut. And Rebecca would bring me certain outfits or we, you know, we had a, a session where Natalia tried on different things. And, and in terms of that, I just kind of went with my gut and obviously with input from Rebecca and with input from Natalia. Um, and that was really helpful because I got the, the woman's perspective on like, oh yeah, I think this is really hot. And, you know, I mean, it was, I really kind of took their uh, guidance in that. Um, because I did want it to be empowering for, for Natalia and her character, and I wanted her to be comfortable with, with what she was wearing on screen. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know if, I, if well, Nat Natalia – oh, go ahead. Well, I mean, the note that I get from people who see the film is they, they – especially women, they rave about how great Natalia looks and how great the costumes are. And, again, Rebecca Michaels – was the costume designer and they just go on and on about how fantastic, fantastic a job they did with Natalia's looks. And then I go, well, what about me? And they go, well, you're fine. That's fine. I mean, it's like we <laughs> threw together five Oxfords and five different pairs of blue jeans and, and I was done. But um, I think that we kind of, I think T worked with Natalia and Rebecca and even if T's kind of saying it wasn't conscious, I think it kind of worked just, incidentally because they were in tune with what the story was doing and i do think that the costumes also reflect kind of the arc of the mood um and whether it was happenstance or not and i don't really think it was actual happenstance i thought it, i think it was like it was, it was it was ingrained in what they were doing so i think it works very well thanks sure well now now we're looking at uh, the light uh, in the foreground, which is one of the examples of one of the shots where T was very meticulous and would take a while to set up, and I would be sitting there going, "We need to get moving. We need to get moving." Why? Is <laughs> How's this going to look? And then, when I actually, came, I'm like, "Well, that was definitely worth the effort. It's a great shot." So, <laughs> Thanks. Many of those examples. So. Well, there, the, yeah, there was a lot of controversy around that one light. Uh, I shopped for a long time and found just the right light and I, I fell in love with it and you know I, I knew that I wanted it and, and uh, he, one of the crew members, um, probably Jim because he was for the most part the only other crew member um, for most of the shoot, <laughs> uh, opens up the box and says, well, there's no plug on it. We can't use it. So we're moving on and I'm like, no. <laughs> We're going to figure out a way to use it. <laughs> I was like, there's got to be some way that we can rig this thing up well, to actually. I was concerned that their rigging it would uh, would burn down the building. So, yeah, I was a little. <laughs> <laughs> right. It all worked for the best. Well, and that's when I got on the phone with my electrician friend who was not actually on set, but he guided another one of the crew members, Maureen Dodge, into rigging it up safely so that you know, it had a plug on it and we could actually use the light and plug it in and and uh, do it safely without changing the structure of the location where we were shooting. We're bringing the building down. We're burning the building down, yeah. I wasn't paranoid about that, but I, I uh, now I know where your head was, Bill. <laughs> I will freely confess that I was. That was definitely, <laughs> an element, uh, definitely an element of where I was, so yeah. <laughs> Just found that out right now. Yep. <laughs> uh, the uh, the section with the which we just had with the uh, with the books uh, is one of my favorite moments of, of character development for Esmeralda because it's it it's the point where she really you know, within you can feel within the arc of their relationship where she's going to go yeah. Do not underestimate me at any level, and it seems like it's you know such a pivotal subplot for her of that mo of that that hour is the one where I think there's a, there's a lot of definition of their their relationship going on. I, mean, I was wondering about that you know for uh, 
you know, uh, Bill and Natalia of, of that particular sequence because it just seems like Esmeralda's glee in there going like, just do not think that just because I'm here for an hour, you can treat me like an idiot and that you're renting, you know, my time. Don't underestimate me at any level. It feels like, you know, it's one where she's really stepping up and saying, okay, this is, you know, there's, she's prepared to test him at that moment. I was thinking about that particularly for, for uh, Unital, you was like that, that section of the film and that that bit of the performance. Yeah, so that one was my favorite. I, lo I loved it so much because it was a lot of fun to, like I said, play with the language of the script. And especially that's what I was talking about in the beginning when I was talking about the power dynamic and how she, uh, her character, uh, her as Anna, right, gets off as being Esmeralda, right, because she steps into this role. And then her fully stepping into this role is kind of just testing the waters and, uh, and just letting him know where we all stand, like where the both of us stand in this dynamic. And it's just like so much fun to play and just to uh, be, uh, you know, like I, I had a lot of fun just playing with him testing him like you said um and just letting him know i was setting the tone if you will in that first episode of just what to expect because at the end of the day it's like i do see it as a job as well and this is part of the whole aspect of what i do like i think that she's a very intelligent woman so she is like how am i going to play with this right now how am i going to like treat him differently than i do another client that may be doesn't uh, like reading as much you know so it's like she almost like walks into his house and observes what she sees and then she's taking in who this person is and then kind of just um like taking it in like as a sponge to know what he likes and um and just to you know just to have fun with him well yeah i mean it's about it's the first it's their first meeting so you know being a sex worker inherently involves some danger. So I think that she, uh, Esmeralda slash Anna in that episode, in the script that I wrote, um, is clearly setting the boundaries and she's kind of keeping him on his heels. And the way she's keeping him on his heels is by kind of throwing his library back in his face. Like she's basically going, I, you know, I know these names. I know what you're up to. I know what you're about. Don't think, you know, don't think you've got anything over on me. And I also do think that it's, it's a younger woman who is kind of just trying to demonstrate that she's intelligent as well and that she's on the same level as the person that she's dealing with. Um, and again, as you go through the different episodes, if you go in chronological order, then that wall kind of comes down for her. But this first episode, she's definitely got her wall up and she kind of is using the banter to kind of make sure that Greg knows that that wall is up. Mm hmm. Yeah, exactly. Just like treating it like that. that's that's like I like to say that that first up that first scene is like her at her fullest persona. Um, and then by the time that we get closer and closer, it's just like, that's not who she really is. Like she, she, it starts like going from Esmeralda to Anna. Right. right. Yeah. How is this, um, scene for you guys the seduction scene or did you already talk about that just now well we didn't we didn't really talk about it um i uh it's you know i i really enjoy that it's kind of the culmination of the build-up and i really like the music with it um i think it kind of it buttons that section nicely i think i think it's really well done so oh i mean is the actors how was it in terms of your comfort level and Oh, well, mm -hmm. I wasn't comfortable at all. <laughs> um, the, is, the story that I tell is when we were, we were rehearsing way before we shot, and in order to kind of start building the intimacy and the connection between Natalia and me, you know, T had us kind of disrobe, not all the way, but, you know, just to our underwear. And we were sitting in our underwear on, on you know, the side of a bed waiting for T to be ready so we could run some lines. And I was just like really uncomfortable and, Natalia just kind of looked at me and she goes, you're the one who wrote it. <laughs> so, I mean, it was just kind of like, you know, just deal with it. You know? <laughs> exactly. Every time that Bill got uncomfortable, I would tease him. <laughs> Every time that he would get uncomfortable. That's like, true. 
you wrote it you uh, put yourself in this situation you're the actor so like what did you expect <laughs> well back when, back when you're writing the script you're saying to yourself well i really want to challenge myself and i really want to push some boundaries and i really want to dare myself to be you know uncomfortable and then when it's time to be uncomfortable you're like what the hell did i just do what have i done <laughs> This is, yeah. really, this is really a bad decision. So. Well, Bill yeah, was so I, conscious. Oh, go ahead, Natalia. Oh, yeah. No, that I always try to do it to kind of just like get him to laugh. Like, I actually don't know, Bill, if that actually made you feel more uncomfortable that I tease you. But I was trying to just like lighten it up. So you no, wouldn't. It didn't, you know. No, it didn't make it worse. It was, it, it, and it was, I mean, again, just bear in mind for the first three and a half weeks of shooting, we had a very small crew, but the only actors were Natalia and me. So, I mean, we, you know, just by virtue of being the only two performers on set, I think naturally we got, you know, we got familiar with each other and we got comfortable with each other, which I think uh, mirrored the arc of the script or mirrored the arc of the movie, which, so I think it was good. So no, it didn't make me uncomfortable. And plus Natalia seems to think that every time she, <laughs> Every time she says something that I don't laugh, it's because I'm uncomfortable. She fails to understand that there are other options to why I'm not laughing at something she said. <laughs> I, Thank you. I just found it very ironic that Bill, Bill and I both were very conscious of not making people feel uncomfortable on the set, and especially because we knew the sexual nature of the film and... And we wanted, you know, especially the, the women, everybody to feel comfortable. And and I just thought it was ironic that I, and I don't want to speak for you, Natalia, you can, you know, disagree with me if you, if you don't agree. But um, my perception of it is that Natalia felt very comfortable most of the time on the set. And Bill was the one that would get uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's fair. <laughs> right. I think it was because I come from a theater background um, and in theater, like especially when you're backstage, you're just kind of like used to, uh, you know, changing in front of people. And it's just kind of it's something that I got used to since I was like really young. So it didn't make me uncomfortable, especially because I knew that I was acting. So it, like, I, I don't know, I, I'm able to create that boundary with myself in my mind of like understanding that this isn't real. So, so it's, it's not a vulnerable for me in that moment, right? So because I, I guess in my own way as an actor, you, you kind of put that boundary up of just being like, okay, like, I understand that this is a fictitious, you know, a situation as opposed to me like vulnerably exposing myself in this moment. Um, whereas, I, whereas I come from a Catholic background and uh, <laughs> I'm generally uncomfortable to begin with. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm also, well, as, a, as, a, as a person, I'm also very open talking about sex. I think it should be totally normalized and just like, you know, it's just like everyone has it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's, um, you know, it's a part of being a human being. So the more that you kind of openly talk about it, then people maybe just like shed their walls of like this taboo subject. Well, I think, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I was, I didn't, I thought you were finished. Sorry. Um, no, okay. I, uh, yeah, I think that there were certain points where Natalia and I would maybe get a little too comfortable and that would like, we had to, we had to, <laughs> we had to, you know, there was a balance. It's like, okay, we don't want to go too far over the top and, you know, make, and Bill, I'm not trying to, I feel like I'm making you sound like a delicate flower, which you're not. I, 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 but there were certainly times when I know that Natalia and I maybe took it a little bit too far and had to like back up. Well, I, don't, I don't think that, I think you have to also bear in mind that my overarching concern during all of the banter and all of the playfulness is, are we going to make our day? We only have to make our day. I've, yeah. I've, asked, I've asked my family and friends for money to make this movie. So yeah, right. so, yes. Yeah, yeah, don't was, just the producer concern. That's all. Yeah, he right. was he was switching hats like as an actor, then being producer, and and yeah. that's because I've done that too, and like that you, your brain can't split into. It's like it's uh, it can be challenging. So for yeah. sure, and from my perspective, and I understood that perspective as well. You know, also producing it, but not raising the money like Bill. So, you know, Bill had that added pressure. But for me, I know that if it's a, if it, obviously you want a safe set, but if it's a tight set, it's, 
it's hard for, it's difficult for the actors to feel comfortable and loose and be able to explore what they need to in order to get the performance where it needs to be. But I mean, obviously we found that, that balance, but yeah, you know, but ENT had a lot of fun, really pushing. We, fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> again, again, they're assuming that I don't respond and they're pushing my buttons. And, you know, it's not, it's not 100% of the time. Sometimes you just, you don't swing at every pitch. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. For sure. Definitely. There were definitely moments that I had. Oh, go ahead, Richard. Sorry. There was a, a fascinating little exchange that we just had there where uh, Anna refers to herself as a uh, Latina courtesan. And it's one of the elements of what we're talking about power dynamics here is that it's not just that it's an older man and a younger woman. It is that, you know, that she is Latina and Greg is white. And there's, you know, the, the, the line about Lupe, the, uh, the house, uh, the maid is this, this little trigger there. And I was wondering, uh, Bill, about, you know, was Esmeralda always going to be Hispanic? Because bringing that in adds this extra layer of like, you know, of, of discussion and conversation about power, um, uh, in particularly in, in modern America. That I think you suddenly, you know, when that moment happens, you can see that Greg goes, "Oh, I just stepped on a landmine. I did some, you know, that, that's such a, a, a again another little twist in the dynamic." So I was wondering about both, uh, you, know, you know, Bill and, and Natalia about that because it is an additional aspect. Um, well, yeah, I had always intended uh, Ana Esmeralda to be Latina, yes. Um, in fact, and we can get into this, is that this is actually part of the story of how Natalia was ultimately cast. Um, we were really struggling to kind of find uh, an Ana when, we when T and I were auditioning people. And, um, and then actually Kristen can speak to this too. And we actually had cast, and there she is. Um, and we had actually, uh, we had, we had, had a woman who was coming back for callbacks who would have would have passed or would have been you know you would have been believable as Latina but she was not Latina and I did really kind of grapple with that um, because I definitely wanted that to be not an overriding element of the story but an aspect that it's not simply just older man younger woman but there's there's uh, an ethnicity difference and I think that little courtesan episode kind of shows her, um, Anna's character that she's already kind of warming up to Greg enough to bust his chops on it, but not to really be seriously offended by it, which I think is then contrasted later on in the film with another incident, which I'm not going to spoil yet. But, um, but we were struggling to find uh, Anna uh, during the auditions. And then we had cast somebody in another role and she hadn't read the script yet. And when I sent her the script, she got very upset and turned down the role when she thought that we were actually trying to slip a pornographic movie under the guise of a legitimate film. And I, T would T just let that roll off his back. But of course I was terrified that the cops were about to break in. So I called Kristen to kind of, cause Kristen had read the script and I wanted some reassurance from Kristen that, you know, no, it didn't come across that way. And, you know, I was, you know, this woman was kind of really reaching in what her analysis was. Uh, and Kristen reassured me. And at the same time, she goes, well, have you cast Anna yet? And I said, no. And she goes, well, I have a friend, Natalia. Uh, would she uh, be, in, you know, would you mind if she read for it? And we, I said, no. And then she came in. That was a Friday. And Natalia came in on Monday and had the part by Tuesday. So, um, so yeah. So Kristen can maybe speak to just having to deal with an uncomfortable or a neurotic bill calling her in a panic. So. <laughs> Well, she can't hear us. Well, it's really cool because, oh, sorry. No, I can't. Okay, go I don't know if you can this. On my internet is terrible, but Natalia, I had just hear me. I'm um, only really every yeah. other word. So. Can, can you turn the volume down on your TV? I think that's done a play with Natalia, and she was brilliant and talented. Uh, oh, is that what's going on? It's the movie. Okay, Can you, is that better? Try again. Oh, forget it. <laughs> ah! We heard you say. Ah! Okay. <laughs> I. 
<sighs> I wish I knew sign language. Anyway, Natalia, I have, I was doing a play with her and she was brilliant and funny and beautiful and she was perfect for this. And I couldn't believe it. And I was so hoping she would get it. And I was so hoping she killed it. She went in there and just killed it. So I hope you can hear that, Natalia. You were Yes, brilliant. I heard it. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, it's funny that Bill says that she auditioned on Monday and got the part on Tuesday because in my mind, she got the part on Monday when she auditioned. Like there was no doubt in my mind. <laughs> I think that's fair to say, yeah. Right? But we, but yeah, Bill, Bill was very pragmatic about it and said, "Let's sleep on it and make our decision tomorrow." And I'm like, "We can sleep on it," but I, but that's Esmeralda. <laughs> well, I, the, what I tell the, the woman and the woman who had the lead, had the you know the inside track on it came in to do the callback, and then Natalia came in and just blew us away. And Natalia left, and I said to T, I go, I guess we have a problem now, meaning that we have two actresses. And T looked at me and goes, I don't think we have a problem at all. <laughs> so, yeah, I think the problem is solved. So, yeah. Right. <laughs> I think we just solved the problem. Right. Yeah. But it, one of the fascinating parts of this is, is you know, the, the dinner segment of the, of the story which is the one time where you blow the world open um and it's not just then in the apartment it's obviously so pivotal to everything that's going on but i was wondering about you know you could have done this solely with them in the room what was the moment where as a writer you went i have to break this open we have to actually see what happens at the, uh, uh, during dinner particularly because you know you, you were talking about you know this is indie filmmaking this suddenly means that you go from your nice sealed bottle uh single location to hander to okay we have a location we have a complicated location we've got more characters being introduced like uh, you know as a writer that you know that's you're and, and, a, and as a producer suddenly you're putting a, a big new change into the into it that you know is is going to affect everything from on the production side and in the storytelling side so i was thinking about that bill of like bringing that element in um sure I, it's it's ironic of course because again i talk all this talk about how we're making a micro budget film and you know we have to keep costs in mind and I sat down to write a micro budget film uh, with the script and I'm like, oh, I'm really keeping things small. I'm really keeping things inexpensive. And then I read the draft and I'm like, you have a restaurant in here, idiot. And you have a moving car in here, idiot. Those, those things are not cheap. Um, but it was important to the story because they have this arc, uh, Greg and Anna as Morelda have this arc. And then, yeah, it, it, it has to be kind of put into the world. And this little cocoon that they've been kind of, building their intimacy in has to kind of get broken by real life um, and kind of interrupted by real life. And they're, you know, with, you know, with escorts and with clients and so forth, obviously the, the relationship is, is in some way built on fantasy depending. And this was just kind of a way to kind of um, just, just tear the fantasy down. And uh, to T's credit, um, I mean, I had the restaurant uh, scene throughout, but T really worked on me to kind of really work on that scene and sequence myself to really tighten it up and really kind of let it serve as kind of um, a release. Um, you're, you're kind of cooped up with these two people for an hour and then you get to the restaurant and it kind of not only gives everyone kind of a sigh of relief, there's also some comedy um, where it's a little bit more fraught during the first hour. Uh, the comedy really tends to work. Um, and then it's just kind of on rails in terms of the pacing and in terms of the structure, it's a little bit more conventional and kind of just really brings the film to a conclusion. So it works on both a film level, but I also think it works on a story level in terms of just, you're right, taking them out of this fantasy, you know, apartment and putting them in the real world. And it also means that that's when you see Greg and Stacy, who... Right. Stacy is the character who clearly has his number more than anybody else until, you know, Esmeralda's revelation. Uh, I was talking about, about that, you know, the, and, and, you know, uh, Kristen of, of, you know, Stacy as a character and where you, how you came at, at her. How, 
how I came at her? Yeah, as a, you know, as, an act, as a performer, you know, your your take. Was on, that was that the question? Yeah, your take on on on, on your character. Well, like you said, I feel like she's the grounding force. Um, she does have his number. There is a huge history with him. So you see who he is, Esmeralda, but also who he's a man and a father. Um, I don't know if you guys can hear me. Um, uh, the great thing is Bill and I have a history. So it was a great fit and we had a blast because we have known each other for a while. Um, and, uh, so that, that was, that was one part that's already done. We don't have to really work on that already as an actor, it's, it's there for us. But I always felt that she was the, the, she always was the word of, or how do you say it? She had the, she was a reasonable one. Everything else was going on, if that makes sense. Um, and yeah, I, I, how I went at it is, you know, look, divorces are weird and funny and messy. I've never had one. But, um, there is still pain, but there's also still love. So I went about it that way as well. Uh, their life together. Uh, Bill and I talked about it. We created a history together. And, um, and then where we are you know, where we are now, if that makes sense. I, you're in, yeah. You're am I, fine. <laughs> I feel you're like fine. I'm talking you're into good. an ether. You're good. The joke that I make is uh, the joke. Okay. So, we'll sorry. It's just, it's uh, you guys. I'm, the joke I make is yeah. that uh, Stacy is the adult in the movie. So, yeah. I mean, she's the grown up in the film. So. <laughs> and Kurt, well, I think she still loves him. I mean, it's obvious. I think so too. I thought, I, I mean, just to echo what Kristen said, I thought that they had great chemistry together. And the great thing, Kristen, I don't know if you realize that you did this, but uh, it was, it was pretty incredible that, you know, when we started shooting the, the restaurant scenes, Bill's level of stress went like this when you were around. <laughs> he was he was just a different. He was just much much more calm. Like you know, it, it was it was great. I mean, it was a great. Not not only do I think that comes across on the screen, but I think it it helped in terms of you know, just the energy on set of like there was suddenly this new life and Bill was more calm and seemed to be having a lot more fun and you know. Oh, well, I, I had produced a play that I had cast Bill in. So the roles mm. were reversed. Um, back then, he <laughs> saw me stress out. <laughs> but no, Bill, you guys, that was a tough shoot. You know, that was a really tough night. Those night shoots were really, and you guys were so, I remember forgetting <laughs> lines. I was having a lot of problems with lines and I was tired and, it's a, it's a, you know, for people that aren't actors and don't understand or, or work on television, night shoots are brutal. And you have to change your entire sleep schedule, your eating schedule, your life schedule. We're driving home and it's 6 right. a.m., you know, <laughs> and you almost feel like, it, wow, this is what it feels like <laughs> it to be a rock star, part of your, but it's so, it was, I had a blast at, at that. That was the best night, all of us together. Or how long uh, we did, did four overnights. Um, and again, we've all kind of alluded to it. After yeah. three and a half weeks of just Natalia and me, then to have like a whole family and like a restaurant and being out in the world, it was a completely different energy and being at night. I mean, it was all mm -hmm. like I, it was all like it was 180 degrees. And then by the time we got to the restaurant, I mean, again, I, I hate to keep harping on this, but by the time we got to the restaurant, it was like, okay, we're going to finish this. We're going to put this in the can. So yeah, that was mm -hmm. definitely, it was definitely relieving to me. Um, but I just think every kind of aspect of what we were doing after the first three and a half weeks was kind of reversed from what we had been doing, you know, it's just, it's just such a switch up. So, um, and I think it, again, served the story and served the film. And two things. One, I just wanted to um, 
also say that Kristen was the other one who, when she auditioned, and obviously Bill and Kristen knew each other, but they both agreed that, you know, uh, that, that she would audition for it. Cause I, I didn't know Kristen at all. And, and it was another moment, just like the Natalia moment where I said, well, this is obviously Stacy, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it was kind of a, a, a no brainer to, to cast Kristen and, <laughs> and, um, that, that, I, I just did, I wanted to be fair and impartial, but it was pretty, I was, I was not surprised, but I was relieved. Kristen walks out of the room and T's like, all right, well, I think we solved that one. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, and, and literally, literally everyone who watches the movie raves about Kristen, you know, my, yeah, everyone I know talks about her performance and, uh, you yeah. know, yeah, I've known her for years and, you know, I mean, it was, it was a lot of fun to watch. So, oh. Yeah. And then Kristen is phenomenal. I worked, yeah, like you mentioned, just what she thinks of me. I, I think tenfolds of her. She's an Thank you. actress. Mm -hmm. Oh, you got it. <laughs> the love fest has begun. Oh. In and it's our anniversary, <laughs> Natalia. It's our anniversary. It's it, We did a play five years ago this month oh and it, on stage. Great. and So oh it was our God, anniversary. So exciting. Why <laughs> Um, to comment on the on the um, yeah. <laughs> on the yeah. overnight shoots, it was. He, uh, Richard asked here. what the play was. Oh, um, oh, it was called "Women Without Walls" at the Lounge Theater by Robin Rice, and uh, yeah, it was an it was an incredible piece of. I played a nurse slash deaf. So, what do you call the the person that comes to get you? Deaf. Person that comes like when you die, Natalia, you know what I'm talking about. I forgot, <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> no, like literally, like I was a nurse. Oh, what is it called? Uh, it was it. I didn't, I'm not hearing it. Death. I mean, it's when death no, comes no, like knocking the at your door. I was, oh, yeah, I was the, 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 I was the, 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 the human version of. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> disguised as a nurse that knitted <laughs> through the entire play. Go. It, I know it sounds ridiculous. It sounds <laughs> it ridiculous. <does. laughs> I played a an angsty, an angsty uh, team. Mm -hmm. Anyway. <laughs> well, you were, Natalia, you were going to say something about the night shoots. I oh, think. yeah, that it was, that was, that was probably one of the craziest things because we were filming for three weeks, just like on a regular schedule. I think it was like nine to five or six. And then all of a sudden it just started getting, I had to like, I think in a day completely switch my schedule um, to be awake from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. And I remember actually falling asleep. <laughs> like in one of the <laughs> that wasn't mine. And I would like wake up and be like, oh my God, where am I? <laughs> we did. I do remember. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh my God. It was hilarious. And then after those like four nights, then we had to switch back up to like regular time to film like the rest. So I don't know. I think I slept for like three days after we stopped filming. It was like, I was very, my body was very confused. Yeah, there, well, there was, I tried to space it out in the scheduling so that we were transitioning from day shoots to night shoots. I don't remember exactly how I did that, but I, there was like a day in between or something. Uh, I don't remember exactly, but, uh, but yeah, just to clarify for people that are watching, the whole movie takes place at night, but all the scenes that take place in mm -hmm. the, in Greg's apartment we shot during the day and we blacked out the windows with a, a blackout material called Dudatine. And we put that on the windows on the outside so that we completely blacked out any light uh, from coming in and then I lit it uh, from there. So it looks like nighttime, but it's all those, all of this is shot during the day. The restaurant stuff was shot at night. Oh, yeah. we're, we're just about to get to the uh, the bombshell moment, the 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 point in the narrative where we get the biggest the biggest shift. 
And in some ways, the two of the biggest moments of, of intimacy balance at the same time. The, um, the pivotal encounter at the restaurant and the, uh, the bathtub scene. And it, it's interesting that those those two are balanced, that they're, they're we're kind of moving into, into this, this closeness and the point where everything blows apart. There was a bit, a bit about, about writing that because it seems to be it's such a moment where you go, here's where they, you know, where paths could have gone either way. And we have this one instant that, you know, pretty much scuppers, you know, this, this, you know, the bathtub scene is the, is the most intimate in so many ways. I was about, like, putting them together and particularly like having the restaurant, this moment in the restaurant scene, you know, we're pretty much halfway through. Like, was it ever earlier or later that we have that? Okay, here's where the bombshell drops. Yeah, there was actually a lot of uh, movement as to where the reveal was and to the chronological order of events. Um, I originally had the uh, the script with the restaurant scene more interspersed during during the night, and then we moved the whole thing to the end. And then T and I worked pretty closely about where the right moments should go. Um, and we shot the script for the most part, the way it was written, we did little beginnings and little ends because we were doing different episodes and we wanted heads and tails. And then Sam did a great job editing, but he was really faithful to how I laid, T and I had laid out the script. And then we watched the first cut and it was kind of like, well, this is good, but we can, you know, Sam made the point that he thought that we could tell the story more effectively. And yeah, you know, T trusted Sam to go off and take a crack at it, and I was the writer, not the director, so I was more than willing to let Sam take a whack at it. And so Sam came back with that second cut. And in terms of chronology, it was really it was really close to what it ended up being. So I do think it's one of those things where, as a writer, I was kind of building towards that that kind of kismet moment where the intimacy is kind of bookending the revelation, but I don't think I hit it with the script, and I think it was T's direction and then Sam's editing, which really got us all the way home. Yeah, I think actually in the very first cut of the movie, uh, the restaurant scene was one big chunk of, it was one big scene. It was like one 10, 15 minute long scene, right. and then we broke it up as we furthered along in the editing process. Yeah, it was, it was originally written uh, to be, to go on the end and uh but even writing it and i think bill i think you and i had discussed this that it, it was always kind of intended to sprinkle throughout there were going to be the quick, movie yeah yes i mean but that was the that was really kind of a process in us finding kind of the right mix um of where it should go and how many pieces should be given along the way and then sam's second cut really brought it all the way out so. oh yeah yeah sam found all these little nuances and connections that mm -hmm. It was really kind of impossible to find in the written word, um, and even in shooting it, that you know, it, it's it's like the you know, those are things you can really only find in the editing. And Sam just did a brilliant job of finding those things. Uh, Sam, the, let's, let's talk about the editing process a bit because you know, there's such a, a, a I, I I always say that. The closest relationship for uh, a director is often with their editor, and there's so many filmmakers I know who, you know, they say, you know, I, if if I can't work with the same editor I've always worked with before, it it, it throws me because it's it's such a it's not a bit of the of the process that I think a lot of audiences think about in kind of a glamorous way, but it's you know, the structure that the editor creates is so pivotal. I was wondering about the you know, you know, with having Bill be so involved and uh, working with T, like the process for you as an editor of, of trying to find where the structure is going to be, uh, because this isn't a, we're not talking like, oh, how long do we hold this, this shot for? It, it, we're talking about constructing the form of the narrative. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, that's that's where the editor is really going to come into their own. I was wondering if you could just talk about that, about, you know, finding the beats and finding the rhythms and how you worked with Bill and T to kind of, you know, find the, how this was going to flow. Sure. Um, so like, as Bill said, when we first did, when we did the first pass, I did basically verbatim what was in the script that we shot. And uh, after our first uh, screening with uh, Bill and T and I, uh, we, we decided 
maybe we could tell the story a little bit better or have have our narrative. Um, the, our, in, in the initial cut, the emotional arc of the movie was kind of going up and down. There wasn't a good consistent ramp up, I felt. So uh, we went back uh, and tried to to get that that good uh, emotional arc. And the way I started trying to approach that was I basically broke the script up into dozens of tiny note cards that uh, gave just a very like one line summary of what the scene was and what the mm. goal of the scene was. And then trying to arrange those in an order that made sense uh, narratively, but also emotionally. And then the process of actually cutting was, it was, we would basically, I would go off and do a pass and bring it back to the team and we would watch it and discuss notes as a group. And then I would go off and do my next pass. So it wasn't quite T and I working side by side in the edit room, but it was it was more of a collaborative notes process that I went and then distilled into the cut. Yeah, and I didn't, I, you know, I'm so used to editing my own stuff historically. Um, I didn't really, I trusted Sam. Sam came highly recommended. I knew that Sam was, was really interested in doing it, was excited about it. And um, I didn't, I know that as an editor, when I've edited other people's projects, it can be restrictive to have somebody over your shoulder the whole time. And I felt like Sam had a good sense. I mean, just from the first cut, I, I thought he did a great job. I'm like, okay, he, he even before that actually uh because we had him sam was on set so he was editing as we were shooting um and i could see just from what he had put together while we were shooting i was like okay well this is you know this is coming together nicely <laughs> like i don't need to be over his shoulder you know telling him what to do and and he you know put the whole cut of the movie together basically like bill and sam said the way the script was written and I knew that it was probably going to need to 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 deviate from that. And based on what I had seen during the whole process, I said, you know, Sam doesn't need me standing over his shoulder or me and Bill or me and Bill and Jim. You know, we don't all need to be there. Sam can do his cut and then we can make notes. And he did such a great job of editing throughout the process that it it was manageable in that way. It wasn't like, you know, we had to just completely recut the movie or, oh, this isn't working or, you know, it was just, he had a great handle on it. And it, I was content to, to let him do his thing and, and then just talk about it afterwards. So if you're used to editing, why did you, why, why did this time did you go, okay, I need to bring an editor in? What was the, yeah, what was the full process there? Um, it's a lot of work editing. <laughs> and if somebody else is happy to do it, I'm happy to let them. <laughs> well, I think also a reason was you wanted somebody on set to make sure, because we were doing something so different, you wanted to make sure it would piece together in a way that made sense while we were shooting it, just in case if it didn't, we could go back and shoot something else. So I, that I just, just started as the on set editor and then just kind of rolled into being to editing the whole film when we were finished. Is it? I, I I was I was pretty sure you had the in my mind you had the job before we started, but <laughs> <laughs> well in my mind too. So yeah, but the the irony was is I didn't know Sam beforehand, and then you know the relationship or the work uh, process that he and T were going through on set. I assumed that T knew him, so when T's like, no, I don't know, I might just call him. <laughs> I was kind of amazed. So uh, it, uh, it was definitely a blessing to get him. And I really, as this being my first feature, I don't understand why everyone doesn't have an editor on set. It doesn't make sense to me. So it's, I thought it was a world of help. Yeah, I had done that on a previous film and saw the benefit of it. And, and that's, why, that's why it made sense to do it on this one. Especially especially with that opening sequence. I mean, that was, you know, three days of people saying, are you sure this is going to work? Are you sure this is going to work? That opening door sequence and, and me going, Sam, let me know as soon as you got that sequence cut together because I got to know if it works now because otherwise we've wasted three days. <laughs> so. Yeah, I remember showing it to you and you're just like, oh, thank God. 
I think I think I was I, I think it was more than that. I think I was literally jumping up and down for joy when I saw it. That's my memory of it. To our people, oh, go ahead. That, that um, opening sequence, um, it, you know, it, it's it's so smoothly done, and you know, Greg, you know, the edit of Greg, or you know, so tight. How challenging was that? Because that <laughs> that's one of those sequences you get where you're setting so much of the tone, and it just seems like you know, Bill, you were hitting very precise marks on that. <laughs> That's all T. I I don't think I, I, I I'm not sure that uh, he had me precise at all. I think I, 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 you know he just had he. I remember having, it was all Bill. I, first of all, my back is to the camera. How could it all be me? But I mean, <laughs> um, I remember having the conversation with T even like way before we started production, where he's like, "I got this idea for the opening, and it's going to be this door. It's going to be this, and it's going to cut together." And part of me trusted him, and part of me couldn't understand what he was saying. So I'm like, all right, man, whatever, okay. And I do remember my lifelong I, struggle. I do remember him being concerned about it, and then being happy when it was revealed that it worked. Um, I think perhaps I was a little removed from his true level of tension because I don't think that would have helped me. But um, <laughs> I, I was not actively forbidden from looking at any dailies. I kind of forbade myself. Um, and uh, I just, I did, I trust that things were going well. And I think that, I do think that door opening is so tight and so well done that it establishes the whole conceit of the film um, brilliantly, frankly. Um, and that's, that's a testament to T and Sam. Well, I think it was it was also repetitive motion on Bill's part. So he was opening the door the same way. And I, I do think that was part of his character, to be honest. I mean, let's give you some credit there. I mean, he was a, a creature of habit. That was kind of something that he had worked into the character. And so he did it the same way every time. I didn't have to well, direct him to do that. Truth be told, I spent my first like 30 or 35 years of my life opening doors differently to like mix success. And then I finally decided, well, you're going to open the door the same way from now on. And it's opened a lot of doors for me. So I can't believe I even just said that. So. Literally and metaphorically, right? <laughs> Sam, were you going to, sorry. And, and the way Sam edited it, obviously, I mean, it, it just enhanced what Bill had already done. Oh, and yeah. 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 I, I don't even know if that was your intention, T, to do the, the cuts between that same shot of the door of, of Bill going to the door uh, or not, but I I just saw it saw it working and tried it and was like, oh, okay, this is great. No, I really did. I hadn't envisioned it that way, and when I saw it, I was really excited about it too. I I yeah, it was amazing. I knew I knew on some level that that sequence was going to work because if you lock down a camera and you show this, you know, something you know, the same thing happening in different timelines over and over that it's got to work. So I was pretty sure it was going to work. So there, there wasn't like this great level of tension in my head. I wasn't anxious about it really, but the way that Sam put it together was like, Oh wow, this works better than I had ever uh, really envisioned it. So that's to Sam's credit and Bill's credit for doing it the same way every time. <laughs> We're uh, we're jumping in and out of the the restaurant scene here a bit. Uh, I just wanted to make a, a quick mention of um, Will Holbrook and Octavio Rodriguez, our two other uh, actors in the scene here, uh, who just brought a great uh, extra layer to everything, um, especially with their their great comedic timing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Bill. Well, that was part of what we were talking about before the switch to from the apartment to the restaurant. I mean, part of all the change and kind of mood and environment and energy were Shannon um, Godwin and uh, Will Holbrook and Octavio Rodriguez, who all brought a, a new energy, uh, and Kristen. Uh, and uh, part of it was those two guys who were both 19 years old when we shot One Hour Alcohol and owned the world. I think they have, I think they have the world by the short hairs. Uh, I was very envious of the way they go through life and their energy and their positivity and their humor. Uh, they, they were such fun to work with. Um, that, uh, again, it goes to what we were talking about before part of the, just the change up in energy in the movie. So. 
And I got to be honest, when I first read that the scene in the script, and I know we went back and forth on it, Bill, um, and you did a great job writing it, but there were certain jokes in there where I was like, I was like, that's not funny. I mean, like, it's fine, but it's not funny, you know? And, and I know funny, right? <laughs> and and I was wrong. I mean, I, you know, there were certain, like, the, the all business thing. I just thought, I don't get it. I, I don't get how that's supposed to be funny. Like, it's fine. I'm fine with it. But, you know, if we're going for a laugh, that's not it. And then, you know, Bill, uh, you know, he, he had a better vision on that than I did because he wrote it. And, and then the way the two of them delivered it, you know, especially Will. Yeah. I mean, his delivery was perfect. It was like. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Boom. <laughs> so, so you know, credit to Bill and, and credit to to Will for for making the humor in that scene work. I take no credit for that. But it's a fascinating scene for because it's when you blow the you know when you when you blow up the relationship between. Uh, Greg and Anna at that moment by putting other people in there, it gives them a whole different context. Uh, you know, Greg, you know, it's the first time you see Greg around somebody his own age. You see the difference between him and, and the two younger men. But also at the same time, you, you see, you know, Anna is, is mature. You know, Anna is, you know, she's closer to, to Stacy than she is to Greg and Stacy's daughter in a lot of ways. It's a, it's a fascinating moment where you just get this, this new depth for both of them comes through. And it's where I think your sense, your, your sympathies start to shift a lot more to Anna and, and away from Greg. Uh, I was thinking about, about that, about, you know, this is the point where, you know, we start to really take sides a lot more. Um, as their as their relationship starts to fall apart narratively, I was I was wondering about that about you know for both as uh, you know for for kind of a a writing point of view but a performance point of view of like you know how far you wanted to take this idea that we we start to lose sympathy for Greg. Um, well, I started with the notion with the entire story of telling a piece about good people doing bad things, and just as the process of writing kind of went along, it did kind of become one of these things where it's like, well, whose POV is this? And I kind of found that interesting that for the first, you know, for the first two thirds of the movie, I think the POV can kind of be considered shared. And then things at the restaurant kind of start to reveal themselves. And then it reveals itself to be Anna's movie. Um, and I'm, I'm fine with the notion that, Greg is not uh, inherently a good person on a lot of levels. And Greg, Greg does things that, you know, he's not blowing up buildings and he's not kidnapping, you know, and holding people for ransom, but he's doing things that aren't nice. And he's doing things that are vaguely sociopathic. And it's, it's one of those things where kind of like the age difference, I kind of wanted it to kind of become kind of buried a little bit underground and then you're reminded of it. So like, Greg's bad behavior was kind of the same way. I kind of wanted it to kind of coast and coast and maybe you have sympathy for him and then something happens where it's like, oh, well, that's not a nice person. And I'm fine with that. If like you're kind of up in the air about choosing where your sympathies lie or you like both of these people and then all of a sudden you like one of the people, I thought that that was kind of the compelling tension of the film. And it kind of, it wasn't something I set out to do, but it was something that I kind of learned during the course of the script. And I think T and I kind of let it ride in a way. And uh, then I think the answer kind of presented itself at a certain point. And I think um, what I want to point out here is in the restaurant scene, one of the many things I loved about working with Natalia Ochoa um, is just the look in her eyes to me it's it's a it's really a masterclass in what an actor and actress can do with just their eyes. You feel what she's going through in this scene just from from watching her eyes without her saying anything, which I just think is one of the amazing things about her performance in it. Thank you so much. <laughs> I tried. Well, I think is in that moment, I 
really, really had to, you know, this is where Anna's like walls really came up again, once again. And it was like such an interesting thing to play just to, exploring all of my internal feelings, but understanding that I couldn't actually show it because there was a bunch of people that had no idea what, what was actually happening behind the scenes. And like, like I mentioned, like occupational uh, hazard, I just like, it, it was, uh, it, it was almost, to, it was great because the scene itself presented itself for me to be able to do that. Um, and like really try to tell what I was feeling and mask it and cover it only for the audience to understand and not for the rest of the cast. Which is not an easy thing to do. Let me just point that out. Well, I think, <laughs> yeah. thank you so much. <laughs> um, Natalia, you, you mentioned earlier that your favorite um, segment to perform was the their kind of first encounter, the, uh, the, the, the blue dress section uh, mm -hmm. and you know, her playing around in the library uh, and establishing the rules. I, at the same time, what was the what was the most challenging of the segments for you as a performer? Mm -hmm. um, I think let's see what was the most. I think there was there was one moment, um, but me and T handled it really well. It was um, it was one of the moments when it was one of the sex scenes and. Like for whatever reason, even though I was like, you know, trying to be light and making jests, like the entire time, there was one moment where I feel like, um, I don't, I don't know what happened. Like my body reacted. It was like in, a, in like in a certain way, and I got like really uncomfortable in one of the sex scenes. And it was nothing that built it. It was nothing that anyone did. It was just, I don't know. Like I just, it, it almost like I got maybe like confused in a second. And I remember like stepping away and talking to Tina. I don't even remember what we said. It was just like. Oh, I'm feeling really uncomfortable right now. But in that moment, it was just so incredible to be uh, surrounded with people that were just like so uh, empathetic about it. And just like, even though I didn't fully know what was going on, because um, I think that's when sometimes like the lines between like acting and reality get blurred that you ha you have to check yourself. And um, and then uh, and then, yeah, it was it was just really nice to be in a, like a crew that was just so empathetic so it didn't even feel um you know i just felt really safe to to actually be able to say something like that and i've heard that that's not been the case in many other like circumstances with that because it, it is really delicate at the end of the day you know billy the same question for you what was the what was the the you know as a performer like the your favorite segment to work on but then they're also the most challenging um, well, my favorite, my favorite segment and my favorite scene is when he gives her the watch, um, you know, right before she graduates, um, right after the bathtub scene. So that scene in the living room where he gives her the gift and it's really kind of evident that they've grown to care about each other and the walls have kind of come down for both of them. Um, I just really, I just get a bang out of watching that scene every time, like this is the end of it. And, um, as far as the challenging stuff, I mean, it's, um, you know, the, the sex scenes were challenging. I mean, it's, that's definitely outside of my comfort zone. I'm thrilled to hear that Natalia thinks that, uh, you know, um, we all handled it well, cause that was, that was paramount to me. Um, so that's really gratifying to hear that. Um, so that was challenging just because of what that is. Um, it's challenging to, it's challenging to act opposite one person for so long. It's, it's, it becomes, it becomes a challenge in and of itself because you're forming a bond in between takes and you're forming a bond during the course of three weeks because you're the only two acting wise who are in it, you know, or you're in this together. So you kind of had to, I had to remind myself where we were in the story uh, periodically and where my character would be. And part of it was simpler than Natalia's, I think, because part of my choice for Greg was to kind of be more stoic and be more of a cipher. But you kind of had to remind yourself that the person that you've been hanging out with and kind of sharing your life with at the makeup table, all right, now you have to be angry with her. Um, that was a challenge for me. So, Okay, yeah, same for you, T. Like, well, 
you know, as a director, you know, because each of the scenes has a different energy and at the same time, you know, so and you're you're directing them, you know, each one as in a, in a go, and then moving on to a different scene, even if in the edit they're they're so interwoven. Um, as a director, uh, apart from managing to get that that light fixture into the shot, uh, <laughs> you know, which, uh, which of the which you see is the as kind of the, the your favourite and the most challenging of the of those of each of the the hours functionally. Hmm. Of each of the hours. Okay, so basically each kind of each section. Yeah. Which was my favorite and which was the most challenging. Um interestingly enough, I think that uh I think that my favorite moments are they actually kinda well I Okay, so I think the Thanksgiving scene is probably my favorite. Um, just to, for a lot of the same reasons that Bill said that, you know, his, his favorite um, was the gift giving scene. I think for me, because there is a different level of intimacy, you feel that um, they're both letting their guard down in a way, and you see that. Greg does care for Esmeralda. Um, he has some insight that she doesn't, but, you know, it's complex for him. Um, and for Esmeralda, it's, you know, she's had a very important person. She's just lost a very important person in her life. Probably the most significant person in her life up until that point. And now she's on this thanksgiving transactional dinner date in a sense um and he's sort of giving her space to not be okay really and she's trying to resist <laughs> not being okay and the more he makes it safe for her the more she lets her guard down and the more we see the positive side of him that hey you know this is what I'm doing is not necessarily the most moral thing, but I'm still a human being and this is a human being that I'm dealing with and, and a human, human being that I care about. Um, and then I, I think, um, you know, another one was sort of outside of the, the hour that I'm really proud of is the section with the abuela and the two, uh, I know we haven't gotten to that part yet, but, um, but the two people that approach uh, Esmeralda, I really, I, I'm really proud of that. I, I think that adds a different layer and 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 adds an element that you know gives you something something to think about and gives you insight into Esmeralda's character and sort of the challenges that she's going through before she decides to get into this line of work. And I I just felt. I remember, I think I expressed this to Natalia. I don't, I don't know who else I expressed it to at the time, but the, as we were shooting that scene, I got really emotional. There was something about the connection and I still don't fully understand it. Um, something about the connection between the, the grandmother and, and Esmeralda that I just found very moving and touching. And I feel it even talking about it now. Um, and in, in terms of challenging, I, I don't know that I could put my finger on one on one specific aspect of the movie that was more challenging than another. I think um, the movie itself was a challenge, you know, to be able to put the pieces together of this puzzle and shoot them in a way where they could be put together and, and make sense in a finite amount of time. I think that was a a challenge, a welcome challenge. Yeah, and I, well, I think that part of the reason is because that scene with the grandma, um, it just, that at least for me was a really big indicator of creating Anna's storyline and her motivation for everything, right? It's like she has a one track mind of just being like, I don't want to continue my family lineage of just uh, 
being exhausted from working all the time. I'm going to go to school and I'm going to find a way to pay for it um, on my own because I am on my own. And then when we find out that the grandmother has passed, it's like, it's truly a situation where she is now completely alone. Like she's an orphan, if you will, um, at age, I think 22. Um, and she's had to figure out a lot of the things on her own, but she, the reason she's so mature is because she had to grow up so quickly to truly see and witness her grandmother and make a conscious decision that she doesn't want to live like that. And uh, in her eyes, the only way to shift out of that is, um, is to become a sex worker um, based off of, you know, the, the inspiration that she gets from how easy it can be, or just the fact that, you know, that it was offered to her. And, and I have full credit where credit is due, the upcoming Abuela scene and kind of the aftermath when the two people uh, approach her wasn't in the original script at all. Um, wasn't through several drafts. And then there was a point where T was like, I need to have a scene where it's explained why she decides to do this. Um, and, you know, I, I thought that was important too. So I set out to write it and I wanted it to be again, non-judgmental and I wanted it to be kind of not melodramatic. I wanted it to be kind of straightforward, but kind of simple. Um, and you know, the end result I think really nails it and it really explains like the previous 70 minutes. And I mean, I'm not going to lie. T would ask me to rewrite and do drafts. And I, there was a point where I'm like, ah, Come on, <laughs> but I mean, it really, it really paid off because it's very. I think it's very understated. I like it a lot, um, and I think it really does tie together the previous eighty minutes of the movie. I, it, like it answers a lot of why, why this, why this is happening. So, um, it's one of the you know million good decisions that T made is to push me to kind of uh, polish that and kind of create that backstory for for Anna. So. And, and it's a it's another element that it that it adds is suddenly you have this very definite class component as well. Sure. Uh, yeah. You know, you know, her best friend just gets given a car because daddy's trying to make it up with with her, and you know she's instead she's she's had to you know there's there's something much more hard scrabble about her, and you like it's this moment where I think it adds this this additional element of not just humanizing her but it, but explaining so much about her and I was because it went exactly in the process of, of uh, you know Natalia was this scene in the script when you first read it because I think it, it's I could see it being a very important character beat for a performer when you see oh this is this moment for her this is the you know and you know so is it there when you, when you read the script or was it was in later edition because no uh, Bill you said it was it was late in the process yeah, I believe it was. Was it? It was, it was there well, by the time you came on board. It was there, but it was not yeah. there in the original few drafts that I wrote. So yeah, but it was there by the time. Mm -hmm. by, by the time we cast it, it was there. Yeah, um, and to that being said, it's like uh, even if it wasn't there, I would have still found some sort of backstory motivations that's the that like that's my most favorite thing to do when i get any script is to just fully delve into the character and create their whole backstory to make sure that i'm not judging the character um especially in the situation where um it's a sex worker and where you know it's a it's a it's a profession that a lot of people place judgment on um so when i read this it did make a lot of sense that that's what it was especially because that's very true in the latino culture and um you know, of, uh, of just, of like, just like strong women, just kind of like breaking the family, the family lineage, especially if it's first generation or even second gener generation American. Um, so it was, I, I liked it because it, it rooted me to just being like, well, this is, to, it, 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 it gave me the, the opportunity to fully explore why she does this. And, um, and you know, not having parents also, and not growing up with parents was also just very difficult for her. You know, so that's why she has to feel like she's in control all the time. We're uh, we're seeing a little bit uh, of the car scenes again. I just wanted to pull up a couple of uh, screenshots of uh, how we lit those <laughs> scenes. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> there they are. I had, <laughs> I had brake lights. That's <laughs> right. I put a red gel on Bill so he had the brake lights. So this is uh, this is the aforementioned famed uh, Abuela scene, and that's uh, Joan A. Shady, who um, really stepped in with short notice and really did a bang up job. And I mean, we were lucky to get her. Um, and uh, as we've talked about, this scene, I'm proud of it for how understated it is, um, and understated yet effective. So I'm pretty proud of the writing in this one, actually. I don't know. Are people asking questions in, in the in the chat or anything like that? I, I don't know. I don't want to neglect the audience. I, I'd like to answer their questions if there are any. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, I haven't seen any come in yet. So if, if we do get any, I'll, I'll uh, pop them up on screen cool. for us. And here's uh, here's the kind of the back end of that villa scene with uh, Crystal uh, Manticone and John Falky uh, playing kind of the reasons why the seed of her profession is planted into Anna's mind. I think it's it's underratedly creepy. Um, they both do a bang up job. Yeah, John Falky, uh, one of my favorite actors to work with. One of my favorite actors of all time, just in general. Um, whether whether I work with him or not. I just, uh, John and I have been friends for a long time. I know that Bill and John have been friends for a long time as well. And uh, John has appeared in uh, many of my other films, Pornographic Apathetic, Carbuncle. Um, yeah, he's he's a pleasure to work with. And Crystal, I met working on a, a movie directed by a, a friend of mine, Evan Richards, which has not been released yet, but uh, that's, that's how we cast Crystal in the role. And yeah, this is one of my favorites, you know, and John, he, I remember him asking me about this moment. He, you know, he just tries different things and that's what I love about him. He has a great sense of play and he'll just try different things. And he'll say, does that, I just thought I would, it felt right at the time. I just thought I'd try that. Does that work for you? You know, him sort of leaning his head back and stroking her hair. I was like, it's like, God, th th does that work? I mean, it seems pretty creepy. And, you know, I, so I was in the moment, he, he does all these things that kind of throw you for a loop in a way because you're not expecting them at all. And it, it goes against my instincts as a director to go, okay, I want everything framed nicely. I want to be able to see your face and I want to be able to see her face and the focus has to be just right. And, and, uh, and then he did that. And I'm like, I don't know. I, I, I can't tell if I hate it or I love it. And I ultimately, <laughs> you know, <laughs> obviously decided that I loved it. But uh, yeah. Is everybody at the credits? Mine's at the credits. Yep. Uh, we are at the credits time. Yay, Sam. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got a. Bill with a T spacing out how often their names appear. I don't <laughs> The rule is no more than three times where it looks foolish. So, <laughs> And the, the, the great score by Kevin Smithers, I got yeah. complimented on that recently. It's really a compliment for him. But uh, yeah. He did yeah. a great job. Um, I mean, really, I mean, everybody who worked on it, and I mean, it was a very small, tight crew, but um, everybody did a great job. Everybody. Yeah. And Natalia, you found Kevin, right? I mean, it was through you that we, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I hooked it up. She hooked it up. I hooked yep. it up. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I'm sorry. Coming up are all the people who helped make this happen. <laughs> you'll see. You'll see. Yeah, very cool title card coming up. Everyone knew yeah. that. Yeah, uh, kudos to Bill for just uh, for for raising the money to to make it, and for all the people that contributed. I mean, it was uh, uh, I know a daunting task to do that on, on any budget level, so. 
yeah, kudos to Bill and for and to all the people that helped out. Thank you. Well, that right. was uh, one hour out call. Thanks everyone for uh, for uh, being here today. Uh, thanks for inviting me to to moderate this. It was a, it was a real blast. Uh, oh, and thank, you. thank you. When your PR folks contacted me about this film earlier in the year, and I, I and said, yeah, they said this is one you really got to want to watch and you know I, I saw it and was so impressed and oh and thank you the the nuance and the uh, and the characterization and just everything about the script and the performance of it and the edit was i was just really super impressed by i um, re uh, really appreciate you uh uh bringing me in today so uh, thanks very much indeed i i, I think we should let everybody say goodbye and, and uh, say what you're working on next because i will always i always like people plugging their next projects <laughs> all right, cool. Well, thank you so much for, for all your kind words and for doing this, for taking the time and for doing such a great job. I had a great time too. And uh, as far as what's coming up next, uh, um, I have a, another feature film called Objects that is in post-production right now uh, that Sam is editing. <laughs> and... Uh, a short film that's also in post-production and uh, in the middle of shooting another feature film called No Apparent Motive. And that's me. Uh, uh, thank you, Richard, for having us. It was really a lot of fun. Uh, I'm working on, um, actually, I'm, wor I'm working on finishing a book, uh, some musical essays. Um, principally about Beastie Boys. Um, and uh, I'm actually writing uh, a script uh, for Kristen and me to kind of work on. Um, COVID has kind of put a temporary kind of stop to it, but uh, that's something I'm really excited about and hoping to uh, get moving on soon. Looks like Mari commented there. Well, Natalia, don't wait. Natalia, you got some plug. <laughs> Thanks, Mari. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was just going to see if anyone else was going to talk. Yeah, thank you so much for your kind words. I, I really am so happy that you enjoyed yeah. it. And uh, the next thing that I'm working on is actually tomorrow, I am launching a video podcast called Wake Up the Power of Your Intuition. So I'm really excited about that. It's on my YouTube channel, Natalia Ochoa. And um, I'm very excited to just be sharing weekly episodes. It's going to be available on YouTube and Apple and Spotify. Kristen? Awesome. Uh, I am about to suffer. Uh, Jerry, a couple of things happening. So, uh, as to show on Netflix, things on Bosch and American Crime Story. So I'm have to be a little busy during this COVID time, but it is. It's weird. It really changed the dynamic. I think of us as actors and being able to work so closely with our directors and our producers, it's, they're just not allowing it as much. So I think that's what's, I don't know, I think it, it's gonna suffer a little bit possibly with that. But anyway, not to get on a soapbox, but that's what I'm doing. And thank you so much, Richard, for this. This was, I've never done anything like this. This was a blast. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, Same here, was, yeah. I've, it was awesome. <laughs> So so thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, actually, and then I, uh, I just recently had uh, another film I worked on come out, uh, The Dark Divide. Um, that's... I, I love that film. That is. Oh, it, thank you. Another film that came out of nowhere, and I and I went. It, it's it's the world's most low key Sasquatch movie. <laughs> it's, it's, it's my, my, not finding a Sasquatch for ninety minutes and and my revelation. <laughs> My daughter's in that one. Her voice is in that one. I just got, just had to put that out there. She and she and her two of her best friends. They're they're the voices of the singing um, Girl Scouts in the background. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The the director of that film, uh, Tom Putnam, is actually who referred me to T to work on our right. call. Yeah. So and then I'm also working on another um, a film with Tom, a documentary called The United States of Insanity, which is about the the rap group The Insane Clown Posse. Um, their fans, the Juggalos, were uh, designated as a gang by the FBI and the Department of Justice. So that was causing a lot of problems for them. And in, in turn, ICP turned around and decided to sue the FBI. So the film is about their story of uh, going up against the government. So that's a lot of fun. It should be coming out next wow. year. And uh, yeah, I have a few other um, 
films that I'm working on right now too that uh, are in various stages of production. Like T mentioned, we're finishing up uh, his uh, film Objects. So yeah, a lot of exciting stuff coming out next year. Fantastic. Well, looking forward to seeing all those projects next year and uh, maybe doing this again for uh, one of those. So thank you. That would be awesome. Uh, thank you all for tuning in for this, uh, this, this live watch party. Uh, Tell your friends to watch one, uh, one hour out call. It's on iTunes. It's on Amazon. You can watch it on Amazon Prime if you're an Amazon Prime member. Uh, thank you all so much. Have a great holiday season. And uh, again, uh, rec uh, get your friends to watch this film because it is great. Thanks, Richard. Thank yeah, you so thank much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Oh, my pleasure. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs>